My name is Mehdi El Radi. I live in Wales. But today I've left the UK and I'm travelling by taxi from Amman in Jordan to visit my family in Baghdad. This is a very emotional time for me. After a 12 hour taxi ride, I'm meeting my uncle Hussein and my cousin Mus'ab for the first time in over 20 years. It's all a bit strange because in the middle of this emotional whirlwind, I'm trying to make a film about my visit. It's the first time I've ever tried anything like this. So here I am in Baghdad again and I'm completely overwhelmed. My grandmother died recently but I'm taken to her old house and 35 members of my closest relatives are there to meet me. I'm having a crash course in the last 20 years of my family history and meeting 27 cousins for the first time. And I've just had the most incredible day of my life. And we had uh, such a lovely, beautiful reunion. It was, it was uh, really emotional. Now I'm in my Uncle Hussein's house um, to stay the night. Okay, good night. I'm standing on the roof of the very noisy Al Radi factory here in Baghdad. It produces enough income to feed the whole family of around between 40 and 50 people. There's just been a meeting today saying that um, the factory has to run throughout any American attack if there is one because flour is one of the essentials. There's a lot of poverty and malnutrition in Iran but luckily my family are all well thanks to this mill. And what a family we are! I feel wholeheartedly welcomed and accepted by everybody. We all went together on a sightseeing tour of Baghdad. We visited archaeological sites of enormous historical importance. We went to holy places of pilgrimage for Muslims. And Uncle Hussein collected some spiritual brownie points by carrying a coffin into the mosque for blessing. We picnicked on the banks of the Tigris, near the power station which was hit by the first US missiles in the war in 1991. The fuel tanks burnt for weeks and my family could see the flames from their homes. Iraqi people love books. Literature is greatly respected. A stocked bookshelf is a sign of an intellectual. Yet people are busy selling these treasured possessions from the pavement. This street is called Al Mutanabbi, but it's been nicknamed Booksellers Row. Some people here have been forced to sell most of their belongings to make ends meet under the most stringent sanctions in modern history. This book market didn't exist before 1991. As you can see, it's almost exclusively men shopping. This is common almost everywhere in the Middle East. It's ironic that you can buy these maps here, but most Iraqis can't leave the country. I'm making a film and it's unusual because I haven't got a government minder like foreign TV journalists here have, but I'm aware of my own self-censorship. My uncle is telling me when I should film and when I should stop. So I'm constantly packing the camera away and unpacking it almost every other street. The hospitality seems almost endless. 
and I'm invited for lunches and suppers every day where large amounts of food is cooked and eaten in my honor. Family ties are very strong in Arab countries and I think they're using my visit as an excuse to have these amazing gatherings. Most Iraqis can't afford this kind of spread. The average wage for a professional is equivalent to six US dollars per month. Um, just wanted to show what $30 worth of Iraqi dinars looks like. Um, these are dinar notes and that's, that's a pile that um, maybe in the UK you get a cheap pair of shoes for or something like that. A pair of jeans maybe. It's quite a, quite a wadge of dinars there. Electricity, as well as other things, is rationed. Most parts of Baghdad have around four hours of blackout each day. A clear reminder of the four months they endured in 1991 with no electricity. At least they've stocked up on candles for light this time. The mill is a state-controlled business, but it makes some profit by selling the wheat husk as animal feed which goes to Syria. Each day inspectors from the Ministry of Trade and Industry come to visit. They test the quality of the flour and enforce quotas that the mill must fulfill. They have the power to enforce fines. My uncle buys them breakfast from the kebab vendor across the road every day. There are some brave people here, from a number of nations, and I admire them. They inspire me. Some are here for a short 10 days, and others are committed to a few months come what may. Their hearts are in the right place, but I'm puzzled by some of these songs. And the media, with their government minders, are some of the only people here. I wonder what the locals on the river think is happening. extremely potent reminder of what war does and that innocent people die in wars as well. Um, around about 500 people died in this refuge in 1991 when um, two missiles landed in through the roof. No one came with me on this trip. My family don't visit the bomb site at Amaria shelter. It's too painful for them to think about it. I'm worried, and I think they're worried too, that if two missiles wrongly targeted the shelter in 1991, then the family flour mill could be wrongly targeted if Baghdad is bombed again. And 
photographs remind you that collateral damage has a human face. Hussein has brought me to the market. There's plenty of produce here, but there isn't the money around to buy. So we are two of the very few shoppers here. Just like most men, Uncle Hussein hates to shop. So when he does, he buys enough to keep him going for at least two weeks. There isn't a great deal to watch on Iraqi TV. The TV broadcasts here are very patriotic. The state-run stations repeat the same clips endlessly, but few people pay them much attention. If you're caught watching satellite channels, including the Arabic Al Jazeera, then you risk imprisonment. I have a lot of respect for Islam and for Arab culture. My cousin Mazen prays like most of my family five times a day, including when he's at work covered in flour in the office at the mill. However, something still seems strange. Although a woman reads the news and doesn't cover her hair, there's a lot of segregation between men and women. I don't shake hands with my female cousins, all of whom wear a hijab to cover their hair. I'm not used to the conformity either. I'm a real novelty here, a non-married vegetarian from the UK. I'm wearing this um, type of cap just because it was pr presented to me as a present by my father's cousin. It's not um, something I've taken on myself on wearing and it's not um, expected of me to wear it or anything, but I'm just wearing it because um, well, I quite like it for a start, but um, it was just presented to me as a, as a gift. It's called an arakchin in Iraqi Arabic, and it's kind of a, a crocheted cap, which some men wear under the agal, which is the sort of scarf headdress which um, people are uh, very familiar with. <laughs> Hello, hello. <laughs> I'm at the Makassib school, which is my old school from 1980. It's incredible to be here. I can't believe it. I've just got so many childhood memories, and um, you know, I'm, I'm never going to forget this visit. I met my teacher and I showed her my school report. She remembers I was eight years old when she wrote it. I was really moved that after 20 years she still remembers me. From my first day in Baghdad, people have been asking me if I know when the war will start. It's ironic because I came here to learn about life in Baghdad but they're starving about news of their own situation and some people expect me to be able to tell them what's going on. People carry guns in Baghdad. This is the gun the government has supplied the flour mill. My uncle's a bit uncertain as to what the threat is he's supposed to defend the mill from. I was asked if I'd like to hold it but I couldn't even touch the thing.
This man regularly comes to sweep the premises. He's not an employee, but he can take home all the flour he sweeps. My grandfather set up this mill in the 1950s, which at the time was a brave move because it was a big investment. It shows this foresight which is still admired today because the mill is still productive. The mill produces seven or eight tons of wheat husk a day, which is sold at an equivalent of 40 US dollars per ton. Nejef Cemetery is the second largest cemetery in the entire world because it's on a holy pilgrimage route. I've come to this cemetery with my uncle Hussein and cousins Muhammad and Mus'ab to visit our grandparents' graves. And we shared stories and memories of them together. I never met my grandfather, but his influence on the family is still tangible. He travelled the world and his portraits in my grandmother's house show a man of great vision. If I'd come here a few months sooner, I'd have seen my grandmother. Even though I was only 8 years old when I last saw her, I've been in contact over the years, and I've clear memories of her telling us kids stories as we sat on the steps outside her back door. Those girls at the school today made me think how young innocent people like that could be potential victims of a war and that's what I'm worried about it's it's um, people like that how they're going to um, have to cope with the aggressive nature of our governments and um, you know any war is as as careful as it as it as it is as carefully planned as it is innocent people are, are going to be killed and what have those young girls done Because I'm used to Western medical care, the effects 12 years of sanctions have had on the hospital where my dad worked as a pediatrician is obvious. Since sanctions began, the infant mortality rate here has skyrocketed to one of the highest in the world. In Iraq, according to the Red Cross, 130 children under 5 die every day. It's hard to believe that by giving my cousin Shahed some crayons, I've broken the sanctions and therefore the law. I've been staying in Fahed's room for almost a month now. I see Manchester United, Beckham and Owen first thing in the morning and last thing at night. They're becoming worryingly ingrained in my head.
Fahad is a big fan of computer games. Even though he's in the middle of his exams and should really be revising. I hate to think that this game may soon become some horrible reality. This is a place called Hawaish, which is about 40 kilometers north of Baghdad. The weather is absolutely gorgeous, as you can see, and it's, a it's, it's an agricultural area with a kind of forest gardening system, which I'm really interested in. They grow really tall palm trees, and in the shade of the palm trees, you grow citrus fruit and apple trees. Um, it's just an interesting contrast to come out to the countryside. I live in the countryside in, the, in Wales, so it's really nice to get out of the city of Baghdad, which is quite a big, sprawling, messy city. Backgammon is taken very seriously here. It's played at such a speed, their hands become a blur. I remember my father teaching me these games when I was a child. My uncle Munder is considered a master by the family and he challenged me to a game. To my uncle's amazement and mine, I won! If there is a war, the flour mill must keep working 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. People need flour. The work is heavy, but the workers seem happy. I've come to the food distribution outlet where food um, is distributed to every Iraqi citizen. And everybody comes with a certain type of ticket which is handed over and in return you get your rations, uh, monthly rations usually. At the moment they're distributing um, three months worth of rations in advance because of they're expecting some sort of a disruption to the food distribution system, um, uh, i.e. a war basically. Um, everyone's hoping this doesn't happen but just in case people are storing foodstuffs and water and petrol and things like that. <laughs> I feel lucky and privileged to have spent a month here in Baghdad. It's a tense and uncertain time. People are confused. They can't plan for their future. My visit has been greatly appreciated by the family. I was a distraction from their difficult situation for a while. All right. I'll just stand in here. Am I in shot? Yeah. Okay. I'll just wait for this truck to go by. Hang on. <laughs> All right. Um, I feel a bit funny leaving Iraq at a time like this. It's obviously politically quite sensitive at the moment. And uh, leaving my family behind when they most need support probably. I mean, I would love to have continued 
uh, staying in Baghdad for another month or so, but th this is what's happened, this is the situation. I'm uneasy about leaving now, because it's crunch time for Iraq. What do I say to my aunts and uncles and to my cousins whom I've only just met? Farewell, good luck, see you later, it all sounds so meaningless. I can only hope and pray that no harm comes to them and that they get the peace and stability that they deserve. Inshallah.